dudes! Welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical! Now today, I will be doing tribute to yet another great comedian. Oh my god, so many people forgot about this guy, but he was so brilliant. Paul Lynn. I'm having uh, this woman, Kathy Fitzsimmons Rudolph, is on the show today. She got to become friends with him for the, the last maybe five, six years that he was alive. And um, she has a book out about the whole scenario. And it is a wonderful read. I recommend it. And it's going to be great to have her on the show today to talk about Paul Lynn's turbulent but very interesting life. The guy had so many theater credits that most people don't even realize and he just had an extraordinary career, you know. I mean, everybody remembers him as Templeton in Charlotte's Web, which is, like, my earliest memory of him as well. And it's going to be spectacular to have her on today. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Kathy Fitzgibbons Rudolph. Hey, Kathy, welcome to the show. How are you today? Good, Tommy. How are you? Thanks I'm, for having me. Oh, my pleasure. I'm pretty good, pretty good. This is a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> so, going back in time, uh, you were a teenager watching Paul on Hollywood Squares, and that's where you fell in love. Yes, I did. I thought he was very <laughs> handsome. But more importantly, I thought he had the best sense of humor in the world. So quick, so funny, the expressions. I thought he was so unique. Yeah. <laughs> did you did you see him on the Dean Martin roast during that time? Sure I did. Anything that had Paul in on it, my phone would ring, my friends would call and say, Paul's on TV, Paul's on TV, and I would, you know, tune in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember he uh, the, when he was on Dean's own roast, he said... The only thing I'd give this up for is being guest of honor at a flash flood. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great line. <laughs> yeah, I always remember that line. Yeah. So you and your dad uh, got to go to the hotel he was staying at, and you got to interview him and spend some time with him, right? Well, actually, uh, yeah, it wasn't an interview. I had uh, done some research, as I did for many years before I had this encounter with Paul, and I found his home phone number in a library book I was doing research on. Mm -hmm. I called the number when I got home, and Paul and answered, and he couldn't believe a fan found his home phone number. So after talking to him, because I knew so much about him, yeah. he didn't hang up, and then I said, I need to meet you, and he said, I can't meet you, and this went on for four or five minutes, and finally he gave in when I said, I'll have my father take me. He said, okay, I'll meet you for five minutes, that's it, a uh, picture and autograph, and that's it. I'm busy. I, I said, I would be happy. That would be great. So my father took me into the pier hotel where he was staying. We walk in. The hotel's on fire. Uh. Like, oh, my gosh, I'm not going to get to meet him. Uh, Paul walked in a few minutes late. He had a chiropractor uh, appointment, and when he came in, they wouldn't let anybody up or down to the suite. So he said, let's go down to the Sherry Netherlands. We'll have a drink. We'll say hello, and then, you know, that's going to be it. Well, that five-minute meeting turned into two and a half hours. Paul and I just, we just clicked, and my dad couldn't believe it. He said, you know, it's like two old friends talking. And we just really got along so well. And uh, after two and a half hours, you know, he did give me the picture and the autograph. And more than that, he gave me his time. And then he wrote something on the back of the picture. I said, what is that? He said, that's my home address. I want you to come see me in California. And I flew out there and... You know, a friendship developed for the next five years till he passed away. Wow, God. And people don't realize this either. This was pre-internet. This is before anyone knew about celebrity stalkers. <laughs> I mean... Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you really took a risk. That is just, oh my God, It's that's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It was unbelievable. I could, you know, I couldn't even believe when it was happening that he's talking to me. I couldn't believe we were... He was giving me all this time. I couldn't believe how well we got along, and then I couldn't believe he said, come to my house, and then, you know, it was, who knew that I'd be, you know, a friend to him one day. That was, blew my 
my mind. Yeah. And you, you asked him the prom. Did he take you to prom? <laughs> I asked him the prom while I'm on the phone with him. The first time ever calling. So I'm sure he thought, oh my goodness, who is this girl? Yeah. He said, no. He said, absolutely no. I cannot go to the prom. But at the end, he ended up saying he'll meet me. Well, about uh, several months later, the prom was coming up again. And I did again ask him now that we had a little friendship going. And he said yes. But then he called me back and, and said he had a uh, contract with Hollywood Squares. He couldn't get out the, in time for the prom. But I was just flattered that he originally, well, second time he said yes. Oh, it, was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, when you guys got there and, then, and the place was on fire, I mean, how serious was it? Oh, some, there was a fireman that uh, got severely hurt. matter of fact, I still have the newspaper from mm-hmm. the, that day. Um uh, nobody's brought upstairs down since I think the fire started in a kitchen, if I remember. Mm-hmm. But it was on the 15th floor, so maybe it was in somebody's suite. I don't remember the detail. But, you know, a fireman did get hurt. Um, and Paul eventually got to go back to his room and, you know, back to his suite. He had a suite. He took his uh, suite there every year, every Christmas, Thanksgiving, almost every year. Uh, he loved New York, and that's where he, that was his second home. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, as time went on, I'm sure he opened up to you about um, his life and, and demons. Was, was he one of those comedians that originally was on the trajectory of being a, a dramatic actor? Yeah, originally he wanted to be a dramatic actor. He went to Northwestern, but he just, you know, he had that nasal voice. And back in Northwestern, uh, in his college years, he was 260 pounds. It was a very big jolly guy and he just made jokes all the time and nobody took him seriously and he did Shakespeare and his class just laughed the teacher was rolling on the floor you know after that you know when he got his first uh, I think uh, his first show was Martha Ray or Red Skelton one of those shows you know he was known as a comedian and that's how people liked him and that he was kind of trapped there forever yeah, I mean, guys like Don Rickles and Robin Williams, they were also on that trajectory, and they fell into comedy, and that uh, was part of their identity and stuff. But Robin Williams, at least he got to win the Academy Award, you know? Oh, he was, yeah, he could do both, both parts wonderfully. Yeah, but uh, Paul, though, he had an amazing long career in theater, and most people don't even realize that. No, that was his love. He uh, performed... Uh... Summer stock, many, many years. I mean, he got noticed in New Faces of 52, just enough in the papers that they actually, he stuck out because they had like a lot of new faces, you know, that they introduced you to and only some would make it. And one was, um, well, there was a few, Alice Ghostly, Paul Lynn, uh, but Paul Lynn at the time actually didn't really make it big. They just noticed him, but it took him nine more years later and he got a, that small, tiny part in Bye Bye Birdie, which grew to a huge part. And that is when his career finally took off. Mm Mm-hmm. And he was so disciplined, like, he knew everyone's lines. Yes. Everybody's lines. And he knew their timing, and he was a perfectionist, and he would, you know, when he's home alone, he just studies lines over and over and over again, obsessively. If If they forgot their line, he'd probably remind them, right? Oh, yeah, and he wouldn't be happy that they forgot. He yeah. thought they should always remember. Yeah. <laughs> he could be tough. He could be tough to work with. Yeah. So when he started doing stand-up, was he playing in the, the Borscht Belt circuit in the Catskills? Um, he did a play there, or some summer stock, but he only did a, the real stand-up uh, where he got his first break to work in nightclubs was at a uh, bar, I think, on First Avenue in the city. I forget the name of the, the bar, but uh, they had a contest, and he had written the night before an African monologue, which got him noticed again uh, from New Faces of 52, and he used it again for, I think, that night, and that opened up, I think he had two weeks to work at nightclubs. One was Vivi LaVue's and another one, and he absolutely hated it. Hated it all. Didn't want to do it. Then he was hated it stand up just you know he'd be doing his act and people were dancing in the aisles and there's no music in his act he used to say so he didn't like he didn't like stand up yeah at all he liked the television yeah 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I did stand up for ten years. I can imagine why and stuff. He probably just hated, you know, all the the, the competitiveness of it, you know, and uh, other comedians, you know, being jerks. You know, he also said he was a script man. He studied Northwestern to be an actor, mm-hmm. and he didn't want to stand up and tell jokes. That's not what he wanted to do. And yet, he was so great at it. <laughs> Oh, yes, definitely. Absolutely. He was a, a stand-up sit-down in the Hollywood Squares. <laughs> he was sitting down the whole time, but he was basically doing stand-up. Yeah. <laughs> did, did he start getting TV and, and film roles based on his stand-up? He got uh, based on uh, Bye Bye Birdie. He started becoming the uh, number one most wanted guest on television, and uh, that really was unbelievable. I think he was the most in-demand guest star for every show, from My Dream with Jeannie, yeah. Hunters, F Troop, Carol Burnett, you name the show. He, he's probably on everything out there. Yeah, I mean, I remember growing up in the syndication era of the late 80s and seeing him as Dr. Dudley on the Munsters a couple times. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and one time Dom, Dom yeah. DeLuise had, had took over for him. And... Um, he was Uncle Arthur on Bewitched, like you said, but many people of my generation, you know, and before, they all they will always remember him as Templeton in Charlotte's Web. That's right. That is the younger generation that still to this day, if they see my book or they see me at a signing and they say, I, I know his voice. And I said, Templeton the Rat. They go, that's where I know him from. And everybody else would know him from Hollywood Square's Bewitched, like you said, exactly. But the younger Templeton the Rat. Big, big role for him. Again, another big hit for him. Yeah, did, did, did he have fun um, d- uh, doing that voice? Yes, he loved it. He loved anything uh, that had to do with like being like kind of like a villainy rat, a funny rat. He, he enjoyed that. He, he got a kick out of that. He loved it. Yeah, because they, they did a test screening of the movie with Tony Randall doing the voice, and it just didn't come off as well. No, he, Tony Randall, I think, did another... Uh, voice, but I forget who but Yeah, but I also remember Paul. Yeah, I also remember Paul was the voice of Pumpkinhead in the uh, Journey Back to That's Oz. What I was just bringing up. Yes, yeah. yes. I think Tony Randall might have been in with him. Yeah, yeah, that was another Journey to Oz, Journey Back to Oz, and uh, they kind of switched roles. Margaret Hamilton, who played the Wicked Witch in The Wizard of Oz, played a different role. I think she was Anne M. I think. I think she was Annie M. I remember. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, Lucy Arnaz, I think, played Dorothy, if I'm remembering. They had a whole bunch of switched roles. But, and, and then um, and Dora, remember. I think she was in that. And she was also in Templeton's Brat with uh, Paul and also from Bewitched in the uh, Charlotte's Web movie. They're all coming back to me now. <laughs> <laughs> Liza Minnelli uh, was Dorothy. Um, I remember Milton Berle was the lion. Danny Thomas was the tin hey. man. And I, I can't remember who else. I do know Bill. No, but it was a great cast. Great cast. Didn't do great the film, but it was a great cast. I know. It took like 10 years to make, too. And I'm surprised the studio didn't take a tumble from it. <laughs> so, so many people remember him most um, from the Hollywood Squares. Uh, did he like doing that show? Yes, he loved it. He said, you know, when he did Summer Stock or when he uh, was in plays, he said, all these seats are filled. It's sold out. And he said, that's from the Hollywood Square. He said, I never thought in a million years a game show would make me a household name, which it did. That's, that's what sold the tickets. People wanted to see him because they saw him in Hollywood Square. Yeah, did he have a good working relationship with Peter Marshall? They got along. Peter knew how to handle him. You had to know how to handle Paul. And <laughs> Peter knew how to handle Paul. They were pals. pal. Um, I think Paul invited him one time to his house because he always had dinner parties and finally invited Peter Marshall but Peter Marshall couldn't go with something with his family he had another engagement and Paul was all insulted about it but you know that's Paul <laughs> yeah did, did he um, get along with Charles Nelson Riley? I think they got along okay nothing they weren't you know real close not real close uh, Charles Nelson Riley and Peter Marshall were very close yeah well it's funny because because uh, Paul and Ch- Charles Nelson Riley, right They don't look anything alike at all, but they were both two guys with, you know, big personalities, questionable Uh sexualities for the 70s, Uh and acerbic vocabularies. I'm sure that they had to have been mistaken for each other at some point. Yeah, they used to say they started 
stole from each other. Or Charles Nelson Riley, I think, once said, I stole from Paul, he stole from me, we stole from Al Stelzi, like everybody. That's what you do. That's how you make it. You make your own personality, you take a little bit of success from each person. Yeah. But didn't Paul have a, have a writer for his uh, jokes on Hollywood Squares? Oh, the writers on Hollywood Squares wrote most of the jokes for him. Yes, absolutely. Um, I spoke to Les Roberts, who said he had the best time writing for Paul, and Paul wrote him a note saying, you can stick words in my mouth anytime. You know, they had a really good rapport. Paul didn't mind any jokes that added him. He kind of enjoyed that. Uh, but he never knew what the jokes... He, he had the answer... But he didn't know the question. Um, so when he said it, sometimes you'd see him laugh himself because it was funny because he didn't know the question and it just would go so funny, you know. Yeah. Paul, uh, you know, the world's most popular fruit, what are you? And Paul would say, humble. And then he'd crack up laughing because it's really, you know, double entendre there. And just if you got it, you got it. And if you didn't, it didn't offend you. So it was kind of cool. Really? Did he offend anybody uh, with his one liners on that show? Oh, this couple of women wrote him and said, you know, you got to leave this Italians alone. And like <laughs> all in good faith. Nobody seemed to, he, he got more love letters from women than anybody, I think, on NBC at that time. And he still uh, would make sure he either wrote back to his fans, signed a picture, he stopped him in the street. He was the most, one of the most gracious, gracious people to his fans uh, as an actor that I ever knew who would take time, let you interrupt at dinner. He didn't care. He would say something nice. He said, I'll always be grateful for that. That, that was Paul's uh, oh. key thing about his personality. Very, very uh, gracious to everybody. Oh, Approached him. No problem with his fans. Loved them. Oh, they made him. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, the, the writers, they gave him some material that you couldn't do today. I mean, stuff that took chances, oh. like... I remember, I remember uh, one question was, what's the currency of Puerto Rico? And Paul said, food stamps. <laughs> oh, God, yes, yes, yes. Oh, there's a lot that, oh, my God, they wouldn't be politically correct today, but they are funny. I mean, all in the family is not politically correct, but people can get it and laugh at it and I wish they could bring these jokes back. I wish they, they would. It was too funny. All of them. Yeah. <laughs> or scientifically, what would make a gorilla cry? Finding out Tarzan swings both ways. <laughs> That's the best. That's the best. And that was a great one for him, too. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> Love that one. Yeah, they hold up, those those jokes. Wow. So it, his last movie was The Villain. Did he ever talk about that? Uh, yeah, he just said it's another bad one. <laughs> that was his attitude. Uh he didn't, uh, he, he wanted to do an A movie. He said, I, I'm always in B movies. But, mm -hmm. you know, he was in Bye Bye Birdie. That movie was good. He hated it compared to the Broadway play. But he had some, he was in Under the Yum Yum Tree. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Glass Bottom Boat. I thought he was terrific in that with Doris Day and Dom DeLuise. See, he just put himself down. He didn't realize there were like four, maybe five out of the 11 movies that he did that I thought were really good. And he just always said, nah, I did 11 bad ones. <laughs> he wanted a big. Uh, he wanted a big deal. He always said, "I want to do something like The Graduate." Yeah. He wanted, you know, an important big movie. He never got that though. That was his heartbreak in his, in his career that he didn't get that. He he never thought about maybe writing his own script. No, he was. He he, he preferred writers. Yeah, he's one of those old time comedians who preferred writers like Bob Hope did. Yeah, yeah, but when we were out, my gosh, he was right off the cuff, funny as heck, you wouldn't even imagine it, just hilarious, and he was, he just didn't have confidence, he said, I'm a script man, I need a script, I don't, he doesn't have the confidence, he's afraid he's not going to be funny, you know, when we were out, always funny, mm -hmm. good, good times. And he owned um, Errol Flynn's house, how did that come about? Um, he was looking for a home. He wanted a home like a movie star, and the real estate agent took him around to a lot of houses. And then this this particular house was actually, I believe, Errol Flynn's ex-wife's house, but I'm not positive. Um, and he bought it, I think, for her. And when Paul found out Errol Flynn's name was attached, well, he just fell in love with it. He renovated the whole thing. I think he put in a couple hundred thousand dollars. Still, 
made it even more beautiful. And, and he just loved the, he was up on the Hollywood Hills. He had a great view and he made that helm into a castle, a beautiful movie star type home. Absolutely, uh, you know, he had furniture and antiques flown in from Italy or France or wherever they all came from. He just really, he had impeccable taste, beautiful decor. And that was his, uh, he was very proud of that. Mm-hmm. You got to go there a lot? I got to go to his other home. Unfortunately, he had just moved. And when I was in his house in Beverly Hills, there were boxes all over. And he was so upset because my, our timing, you know, was, it just happened to be that he was in the middle of moving. Um, and it was very touching because he had none of his decor out, no pictures anywhere. <laughs> but uh, he had a little guest house. And then when we were I was there with some friends, and we all went in the house. And we were, he's giving us a quick tour because there was nothing to see because he was like, oh, I'm so disappointed, you know. All, everything's in boxes. But as I passed his dresser, uh, he had a, an 8 by 10 picture of him and I. And I thought that was so sweet because, you know, nothing else was out, but that picture of him and I was out. Oh, that was sweet. Sure, he did it because I was coming, but it was still touching that he did that. Yeah. Now, do you know the price comparison of then and now of the, that house? Oh, gosh. Uh, the house just sold a couple of years ago. I, I, I could guess. I want to say at one point it was $1.8 million, but I'm sure it's even more now. Mm-hmm. And then he only paid, I think, a couple hundred thousand for it. Or 100000 I think he only paid 100000 for that house. Wow. And then he put in like 200000 <laughs> So. <laughs> yeah. So, when was the last time you saw him leading up to his death? I saw him in August. Was it August? I think it was August. A few months before he passed. He passed in January. Mm-hmm. Um, we had dinner. He was a little bit more serious, I, I would say, even maybe a little bit down when I saw him. wasn't himself fully. I, I noticed a change in him. But he also had a big week, and I thought maybe he was just tired. But, I, you know, I didn't realize then, now I do, that his career was really not going anywhere. He, was, he had quit Hollywood Squares, and he might have been back then. And then they closed it again in Vegas a year later. He had nothing going on, and he just seemed a little down to me. But he was drinking less um, and trying to clean up his life a little bit, get healthier and, you know, all that. But, uh, you know, but we still had a nice time. We had a good time. It was a nice time. And then... Uh, Christmas Eve, he called me every year. Christmas Eve, we always spoke. He called me every Christmas Eve, whether he's, if he's in New York, if, if, if he was here. You know, I would always get a call from him, um, which was very sweet that I would be on his list of, you know, wishing Merry Christmas to And then um, we spoke about two weeks before he passed away. It was New Year's Eve, I think. We were chatting on the phone a little bit, and he sounded good that night. He sounded really good. We had a nice conversation, and that was uh, the last time we spoke. Oh, my God. And um, what, so he was, he was. He wasn't depressed and gaining weight anymore. Oh no, his weight had been steady for years. Oh, so he did great. Oh my gosh! Once he did the personal trainer and the weight marches together, uh, he maintained his weight. He, he promised he'd never go over one hundred ninety pounds, and I don't think he ever did. Yeah, I, I knew he was six feet almost. So with that, he looked good. He always looked good. Handsome, handsome man. Yeah, I, that, I I wouldn't uh, call him fat or anything like that, but he was he was probably just you know out of shape, you know, for him. Um, when he passed. Yeah. Or... When, no, no, I mean when I'm, I'm talking about in general when he was when you say that he was always concerned about his weight. I never really considered him fat. He was probably just over just you know out of shape for him. <laughs> He was 220 pounds in high school. He was 260 when he graduated. He was a big guy. Mm -hmm. And then he lost over 100 pounds uh, before Bye Bye Birdie, um, the Broadway play, and he looked terrific. And then he gained some. He always went up and down, up and down, up and down, 20 pounds, here, 20. But he always, you know, maintained, never never got obese again. Let's put it that way. He never went over the rock the scales again. He always maintained a good thing. I mean, he'd love to sit and eat junk food all day, but he had to, you know, <laughs> discipline himself not to, because he loved junk food and fast food, but he, he, he did a good job. That sounds like me. Yeah, I always say that my, my weight is up and down like a toilet. It's always cha- it's always going up and down and changing. Yeah, because I, <laughs> I love junk food. <laughs> yeah, then we all. <laughs> yeah. 
So, so the coroner, the coroner said that he had the heart of an eighty-eight-year-old mm-hmm. when he passed. Was that from all the cigarettes, yeah. probably, and the, the eating? Yeah. Uh, the weight, the eating. He was a heavy, heavy drinker. But also, you know, if you look back, his mom died early fifties heart attack. His dad died early fifties heart attack. Paul died early fifties heart attack. So it was genetic too. Mm-hmm. So why did you wait so long to write the book? Um, I always thought that'd be a great book about him. Waiting and waiting and bunch. Nobody could write it up and write it. Um, and, you know, it started out with just my adventures of me and Paul Lynn. Mm-hmm. And I didn't think there was enough there for a book. But then I started to realize, you know, I could do his life story if I can reach people. Well, the next thing you know, I have... Boris Leachman, which was his college buddy in uh, Northwestern, giving me information. Betty White giving me an interview. Florence Henderson. Peter Marshall ends up giving me a forward to the book. Then Kate Ballard gives me a great story. And the book is filling up and filling up. Then I got the first interview ever from his relatives. They gave me the first interview. So now I have a book. And my adventures, all in life, and all these people, his peers, and whoever I interviewed for the entire book, Les Roberts, who was the first producer and writer of Hollywood Squares, giving me their Hollywood. I mean, I had everything, and uh, it was just it just grew and grew and grew, and and that was it. Made a book about yeah. Poland and about my adventures. So the difference with this book, I think a lot of people do write great biographies out there. I knew my subject very well, mm-hmm. so I had like a personal take on him. And I also try to be, you know, the voice in the beginning of the book is me at 17. And I'm not, I didn't do it as an adult. I did exactly how I felt at 17. I kept all my diaries, all my details. So they were as fresh as anything. And I used that as the beginning. The rest of the book is, I tried to be as unbiased as possible. Tell you the good, the bad, and the hilarious stuff all in. And that was, that's what it is. And it's done very well. And uh, very excited. I know it's, it's it's such a great read, and I'll tell you one thing I love about it is that you know you don't really delve into his um, sexuality hardly at all. And I remember there was an IMDb entry for years. I looked on there; I don't, it's not there anymore. But it said that when he was in high school, um, he had a girlfriend, and she broke his heart, and so he turned to men. I'm like, that is so that is such a judgmental thing to write, you know. Interesting, I interviewed his ex-girlfriend from high school. Oh, so he did have so, one. Okay. Oh, yeah, he went out in Maryland for a long time. Oh, that 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 was real. And she said she if they were real boyfriend and girlfriend. She never knew she had any interest in men. No idea. Wow. So it's just interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's not, it's, that injury is not even on there anymore, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, so are you ever going to write another book? I, I plan to. Um, just still, I have a lot going on with this book. I think uh, Close to Weekly just came out and hit the stands this week. They did a whole article about my book and me and Paul Lynn, which is really cool. Um, doing other radio shows. I mean, it, it's just such an interest in Paul Lynn. He would be really, really in shock today to know many, many years after he's left this earth in 1982. We are still talking about Paul Lynn and the talent he had and as a, maybe a pioneer to the gay because he didn't hide who he was. But, you know, you'd lose your job those days if he came out. But he did it in a very cool way, I thought. And, um, yes. you know, I talk about me and Paul in the book and my jealousy of Paul and his male friends. It, you know, it was, just, it, was an, it was a great ride of my life and it was a lot of fun and it was, uh, you know, I sadly miss, but I miss him very, very much. If he was still here today, I think he'd still make it big on shows, and he loved to cook, so maybe a reality show he would be doing. He <laughs> wanted to open up a restaurant in Manhattan. That was his goal. That was his next goal, by a brownstone. Matter of fact, I spoke to him. He was in the city uh, around the holidays, and he was actually looking at a brownstone to purchase to make that his second home and thinking of maybe opening a restaurant where he could entertain if he wanted to or not, that he wanted that and be able to fly back to California to make movies. That that was, you know, his plan at 55. Mm-hmm. Sadly, it didn't happen. Yeah. He's greatly missed in the world, uh, 
thank goodness can still see them on YouTube and uh, reruns on Bewitched and Antenna TV, runs them in Cozy TV, you know, you can catch them still. Thank goodness. Let mm. everybody still see what a great talent Paul in was. And, and Charlotte's my Web. My tribute to him. Well, yeah, and Charlotte's Web for all the generations of children. Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Well, I want to tell you, Kathy, you know, being that I'm in the age of the Internet, I'm happy to say I have some Paul Lins in my life. Uh, I, I, you know, get to interview a lot of people that I grew up idolizing and, and, and stuff, and, you know, I get to see them whenever I'm in L.A. and talk privately on the phone and have dinner with them, and it's something oh. I don't take for granted. It's just the most gratifying feeling in the world. I get that. <laughs> totally do. Yeah, there's one in particular who's very special to me. I'm trying to get this person to write their their memoir and, you know, have have, have me help, you know, because I think that she has a great story there and stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not saying who? <laughs> uh, she's actually not that known. She's a founding member of a uh, very um, successful uh, comedy uh, group, and... Yeah, I just think that she has a great story there. I want to try to get her to write her memoir. That would be cool. I wish you luck with that. I hope it happens for you. Thank you. So, uh-huh. Thank you so much. So Paul Lynn, a biography, His Life, His Loves, and Laughter is out. It's on Amazon. And do you have a website? Nope, just sticking with Amazon right now. Actually, you know what? I have a very popular Facebook page. It's called Paul Lynn, a biography. His mm-hmm. life, his love, and his laughter. I'm also on Twitter, Twitter at Paul uh, at Paul Lynn Book. If anybody wants to say hello, I usually say hello back. <laughs> it's been a pleasure, Tommy, um, for having me on the show. Thank you for reading the book, enjoying it, and helping keep Paul Lynn's legacy alive with uh, all your radio shows and talking and interviewing uh, his friend, me. And the author of his uh, book that hopefully, you know, lets Paul, people see the real Paul in. That's what I want people to know. My, I my, remember him always. My pleasure, Kathy. And thank you for keeping his memory and his legacy alive. And um, I hope that uh, that second book you're going to write is going to be, you know, just as good and successful. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate that. You have a good week. Stay safe out there. And anybody reads my book, I do thank you. And I always appreciate a, a review on Amazon. Thank you so much. Stay safe and happy holidays. Happy holidays to you, Tom. Okay. Bye-bye, Tommy. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Kathy Fitzgibbon Rudolph. Ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, my God. That was great stories about the legendary Paul Lynn. And check out the book. You will not regret it. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying... There's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Liar, dudes!